a meeting at Northwestern University. A classmate named C? Don't worry about it. Bessie lowered her head and washed her hands. She didn't have to look at it to know that it was Jared. Clarissa probably mentioned that she was in Evanston. Because of her tight schedule, Bessie didn't want to see anyone this time. She had controlled her location range to be around the music hall and Northwestern University, but had bumped into Clarissa unexpectedly. She didn't expect Clarissa, a war journalist, to have suddenly returned. Bessie drew a towel from the side and wiped her hands. When she returned, Jared's video call had already hung up automatically. Michael was still flipping through her book casually. It was a foreign language book. The content was very vague and the overall background was very depressing. Samuel glanced over, and the esoteric and complicated figures gave him a headache. So he pulled out the paper she had pressed underneath. She mixed a bunch of notations on the page. She crossed out some and rewrote some. Samuel raised an eyebrow. He hadn't expected Bessie to have studied music. At the thought of this, he touched his chin and thought of how Mr. Grint found Bessie. The three of them went out together. Bessie took a dark coat and put it on over her sweater, then buckled the sweater's hood on her head. Samuel knew Bessie would make time to see the tourist attractions, so he volunteered to lead the way. Although it wasn't a holiday, quite a few people had come to Evanston for tourism, though they were mostly elderly. They arrived at a museum. There were too many people at the main entrance, so Michael and Samuel brought her to a side door instead of the main entrance. The gatekeeper was an old man. He knew Samuel and Michael well. When he saw them, he looked up, smiled, and opened the door. He was too lazy to even say a word. This place isn't open to the public. Michael walked slowly behind Bessie. We used to climb over the walls when we were young and lived nearby. Samuel had seen this place too many times and wasn't very interested in it. Bessie didn't really like museums, but she still took a lot of pictures. I'm bringing it back for Scarlet to see. Bessie stopped at every scenic spot and took pictures. She likes these very much. Without a hint of impatience, Michael watched her take pictures with one hand in his pocket. She tried to make the photos as nice as possible, but the results were average. In the end, Michael couldn't take it anymore and reached out to help her. Bessie stood beside him to see the pictures he took. He pointed to the pavilion and spoke as she approached him. You seem to take it at a higher angle than me. Yeah. Michael's ear moved lightly, but he responded casually and wasn't satisfied with his picture. It's all right. Just average. Do you want to take one? Michael paused and smiled lazily. Why don't you post that you're in Evanston? She had many friends on Twitter. Wouldn't everyone know she was in Evanston if she posted? Bessie touched her chin and shook her head. It's too troublesome. Then she followed behind him and watched him take pictures. Michael studied photography before. Samuel lowered his voice and explained it to her. He bought several DSLRs, but put them in the warehouse in less than half a year. He has a lot of hobbies. Scarlet loved these? After explaining, Samuel remembered that Scarlet was Bessie's friend. He raised an eyebrow. Yeah, Bessie pulled her hood down casually. Fairfield was also an ancient building and hadn't been developed. The two of them often skipped classes together in high school. She would go to the library to play games while Scarlet would wander around ancient buildings. Then, they would go home together at night. They were in the last and second to last places at the end of the semester. All the teachers in the school recognized them. Samuel nodded. Then she can study archaeology at Northwestern University. Marvin took it before and it's not bad. He remembered Scarlet's achievements. Brightbow High School's forum used to talk about the two treasures in the school, which were Kenneth and Scarlet. But now, there was another treasure. Bessie. Archaeology had always been a neglected department and Scarlet's grades were more than enough to get in. Bessie watched as Michael took pictures and said as they went to the next scenic spot. She used to want to travel the world. Now she wants to be a lawyer. Hearing this, Samuel scratched his head. A lawyer? It was so different from how she looked. Bessie seemed quite silent after that, while the three of them went around taking pictures. When they went to eat, Bessie's mood picked up a lot. In the afternoon, Samuel took her out to play. 
Bessie said she wanted to sleep as she had to return to Chicago the next day. Downstairs in the car. Michael, let me tell you something. Samuel drove and looked at Michael sitting in the back seat through the rearview mirror. Didn't Bessie say she was finding her relative that night, and then she said her relative was a musician? Michael didn't respond. He opened a blanket sitting next to him and covered himself. Do you know who the musician was? Samuel snorted. Mr. Grint. Michael lifted his chin and sat up. Mr. Grint? That's right. Bessie went to watch his concert last night. Samuel thought for a while and then asked, Since when did Mr. Grint become a relative of Bessie's? Samuel hadn't questioned Bessie, but he was curious. No matter which aspect it was, Bessie didn't resemble Mr. Grint. Michael thought for a moment and then said one word to Samuel. Brian. The Grint family had a literary reputation, and even though they didn't actually have power in the capital, their reputation was still high and several families gave them face, so Robert couldn't make a comparison. Bessie was flipping through the photos taken by Michael. She sat in a chair by the window and sent a video call to Jared. She put on her headphones and leaned her mobile phone against a cup. Then, she took out a pen and paper and wrote on it. You're still in Evanston. Jared put down the information about the applicants when he saw her video call. He could tell from the decoration behind her that she was in a hotel. Yeah, Bessie didn't look up and continued arranging the music score. She had always been very serious about arranging for Noah Hyber and had conceived of this style of music in her mind for several months, but hadn't written it yet. She wrote it smoothly now. Jared put down the mouse in his hand, looked at her youthful face through the camera, and said awkwardly, When are you going? Do you have time to meet? Let me tell you about this year's applicants. Did you check the list? I have a flight tomorrow, so I'm currently unavailable. Bessie rode away, and then put down her pen. Why didn't you tell me to arrange your schedule for you? Jared was a little disappointed and broody. Did you come because of your grandma's medicine? Bessie replied, No, I had some other matters. She thought for a while before asking, Do you know Matthew? Jared leaned back in his chair and raised an eyebrow. Which Matthew are you talking about? From the CIA. This was Daniel's description, and Bessie knew little about it. She picked up her pen again, thought about it, and added, Probably. She had only helped Samuel with a few troublesome people and hadn't invaded his personal life much. Neither did she investigate deliberately. Do you want his information? Jared went back to 129's homepage. Everyone knew that 129 was the world's largest intelligence network. However, this information could only be viewed within 129's building and it couldn't be downloaded either. This was why everyone was racking their brains and trying to squeeze into 129. Give me a copy. Seeing that Jared had found him, Bessie lowered her head and continued writing the score. Bessie didn't intend on meeting him, so even though Jared knew what hotel she was staying in, he didn't dare to come over without permission. He wanted to hang up when he suddenly remembered something he had asked someone to investigate last time. Oh, yes. Do you remember the last time someone suddenly transferred overseas the domestic medicine? Bessie's hand paused and she narrowed her eyes at Jared's tone. Any insider information? If it weren't for Clarissa coincidentally being outside the borders, Bertha wouldn't have been able to hold on until now. Outsiders would not know where she had gotten the experimental medicine that even the Smith family couldn't get. It's a little strange. Jared tapped his fingers on the table, pondered for a moment, and then said, The people in the first laboratory are their deans. They sent these drugs to the border for experimental reasons on far-fetched grounds. Does your grandma know them? I get it. Bessie nodded and didn't answer. She just coldly got rid of him after obtaining the information. If there's nothing else, I'm hanging up. After hanging up, Bessie couldn't write anymore. She leaned back in her chair and was silent for a long time before putting down her pen. She placed the music sheet in her book and took her jacket out of her backpack. As she approached the door, she remembered the black mask on the cabinet and went back to pick it up. Michael had thrown this to her before he left. Northwestern University It was almost four o'clock when Bessie arrived, so there was still class. There weren't many people on campus. 
She walked to the medical department. She buttoned the hood of her sweater and she wore a mask in such a way that no one could see her chin. She exuded a cold aura. Her style was extremely obvious. People recognized her immediately. The doorman at the access control gate recognized her and let her in. Oh yes, it's you. The professor is on a business trip. He told me to give this to you if you came. He took out a box from the cabinet and handed it to Bessie. Bessie took it and opened it. There was a bottle of water inside and a trace of white paper torn off the bottle. She found the torn piece at the bottom with words written on it in handwriting most illegible. Bessie put everything in her backpack and pulled down her mask before thanking him politely. The doorman waved his hand and then asked, You're not a student in the medical department, right? If she was, he would have seen her before. This kind of student was impressionable. No, Bessie tugged on her mask and went out. Outside the door of Northwestern University, Anne, Elise, and Grace were waiting for Thomas to come out. This school is so good. Grace stood outside Northwestern University and took several photos against the door. Many people around Grace were like her. They weren't students at Northwestern University and would come here to take pictures. It was a popular university in the country. Naturally, Northwestern University and the University of Chicago were the main ones. In Grace's era, the whole town would line up to celebrate if they admitted one to Northwestern University. But in their hometown, it was difficult to get a talented student to study at Northwestern University, even after five years. The main reason was that the local area was poor and education was lacking. This was the first time Grace saw Northwestern University. In the past, Elise would have mocked her. However, Anne's apprenticeship was imminent, and seeing Mr. Anderson's attitude towards Anne, she knew Anne was now a student of his. Grace stepped into Evanston's circle thanks to Anne. Elise's attitude towards her wasn't as casual as before. She just changed the topic and said lightly, Of course, Northwestern University is good. Anne can come here next year too. Anne just looked nervously at the school gate. Thomas came out. He had long legs and an untroubled face, so he stood out from the crowd and was popular in school. People would discuss him wherever he appeared. Elise came to tell Thomas about Mr. Anderson taking a fancy to Anne, and she wanted to tell him that there was a dinner tomorrow. It depends on the situation. I have to discuss business with Jacob tomorrow and might not be able to make it. Thomas didn't promise to come. After knowing that Anne had become Mr. Anderson's student, he only glanced slightly at her and didn't seem surprised. He just looked at her casually. He hadn't contacted Bessie in the past two days and didn't know if she was still in Evanston. Since he had seen her at Northwestern University, he would subconsciously look out for her figure while walking around. But he didn't see her in two days, so he thought she must have left. He didn't expect to see her at the gate as he casually gazed around the school grounds. But she was standing with a boy. The two seemed to know each other well and were talking with their heads lowered. Thomas kept staring in that direction and the other three people couldn't help but look over as well. They saw Bessie standing at the door, as well as the boy beside her. The boy seemed to hand Bessie a pile of things. After seeing the boy's side profile, it shocked Thomas. Anne didn't have time to cover up her surprise and said directly, Bessie hasn't left yet? Wasn't she with Brian? Who is that person beside her? It was such a chilly day, but Elise still only wore a dress with a fox fur shawl on her shoulders. The people with Bessie were always messy. She looked away lightly in disinterest. Who knows who he is? Grace's expression was light. Thomas recovered and glanced at them. Luke Song, last year's top scorer in Chicago and first place in the country. Don't you know him? Episode 122, A Family You Should Not Mess With. Every year, Charles Wheeler High School competes fiercely with Brightbow High School. The two old schools would secretly fight to achieve first place in the number of people who reached the undergraduate level, the number of key points achieved, and the number of dark horses that climbed up the provincial rankings. Brightbow High School was a little more literary, while Charles Wheeler High School leaned more towards natural sciences. 
Luke was so famous because he had taken first place in the city's science competition when he was only a freshman at Brightbow High School. He was the first not only in the city, but also in the country. This incident made Charles Wheeler High School, a school leaning towards natural sciences, extremely depressed. Every year, many students enter Northwestern University as top scorers, but there is only one top scorer in the nation each year. Besides being the nation's top scorer, Luke was also good-looking and garnered a lot of attention when he came to Northwestern University. The people at Northwestern University could only look up to him after learning that he had not only suppressed many foreign students in high school and won first place in the physics competition, but had also become the teaching assistant to the physics department's dean after coming to Northwestern University. Unsurprisingly, he suppressed many seniors and became first in the physics department. The students in the dormitory knew Thomas, so naturally, many others also knew that he was a powerful fellow townsman. But Luke always followed the dean of the physics department, so the two only met at various conferences and never actually spoke. Thomas didn't mention these details. Although he knew about this, Elise and Grace didn't. Elise wasn't from Chicago and rarely paid attention to the city's gossip. Anne was a high school student and focused on her own goals, so she had only just glanced briefly at the news of the examination students whom she didn't know. The people around Bessie were hoodlums or gangsters. As the saying goes, birds of a feather flock together. Given Bessie's achievements, she was basically in the company of such people. In Anne's eyes, she could never enter her circle, even after a few years. She didn't say this to Thomas, yet Thomas had dropped a bomb on them. Anne was genuinely shocked, because she never thought that a school nerd would know the school bully, and they seemed very familiar with each other. Before she could say anything, Thomas told them that he was going to find Bessie, and Grace followed him. Anne pursed her lips and followed them as well. Luke encountered Bessie on the road. He didn't have time to take Bessie around the campus before going to class, so he hurried back to his dormitory to get some things. Thomas arrived just after he left. Where are you staying now? When are you going back? Thomas glanced at Luke's back, then turned to look at Bessie, frowning slightly. Bessie nodded at him politely in greeting. I'm going back to Chicago tomorrow. I have some other matters, so I'll leave in the morning. Grace trotted over, and before she could say a single word, Bessie greeted Thomas, lowered her head and pressed her sweater hood down before leaving. Thomas frowned and glanced sideways at the three women who had followed him. Then he said politely, Grace, I don't think I have time to go to the banquet tomorrow. They saw the Perez family car parked in the parking lot. Anne stared at Thomas and pursed her lips, but she sneered in her heart. Bessie wasn't conspicuous on the outside, but her methods were truly impressive. She turned to look at Grace. Mom, how does Bessie know Luke? Grace thought of Luke. He seems to be from Fairfield. Thomas didn't tell them that the dean of the physics department was Luke's teacher. Elise wasn't clear and only said after hearing Grace's explanation. There are many top scorers at Northwestern University, but how many of them are distinguished? It's not like Anne can't get into Northwestern University. Evanston was a big place where many unfair things happened, so people with no background could only excel after experiencing resistance and trouble. It was extremely rare to see outsiders excel. It was like anticipating a fish's transformation into a shark. In Evanston, any random person had an extraordinary background. Such people were common, so after seeing Luke, Elise could only compliment that he was rather excellent. Thomas didn't chase after Bessie as she walked away slowly. She entered the crowd of people and disappeared in half a minute. He stood there, frowning. The phone in his pocket rang. It was a phone call from Jacob. Thomas picked it up and stopped walking. Then he called for David. Don't worry about this matter, Jacob told him. After hearing Jacob's description, David was silent for a while. Bessie's reaction was as he expected. I won't have time to go to your sister's apprenticeship banquet tomorrow, but you should go if you're free. They both said little, but David's reaction caused Thomas's heart to sink. 
He was so smart that he naturally thought Bessie must have had a quarrel with the Smith family after he left Chicago. Otherwise, David would have questioned further. And Bessie wouldn't avoid him like that. Bessie returned to the hotel. She looked at the transparent bottle in her backpack. A piece of paper with the word Q was pasted on it. She peeled it off and threw it away. After looking at it for a while, she put the bottle on the table and held the piece of paper with messy handwriting on it. There were many professional terms on it, most of which was especially used in the medical department. She casually looked at it and then put it back in her backpack. Lowering her head, she continued writing her unfinished music score. This time, the inspiration stayed in her mind for a long time. Be it the selection of the tone or the beat speed, she had a plan in her heart and worked hard to write it down. At her feet was a pile of crumpled papers. When it was 7 o'clock in the evening, she took a picture of the frame and sent it to Noah Hyber, who was recording the theme song of a movie in his studio. He was always very serious about music and didn't leave until the next afternoon. So his cell phone was with his manager. Managers usually kept the entertainer's cell phones to avoid missing important calls. His phone lit up and the manager waiting outside yawned involuntarily. He took it out and glanced at it to see a Twitter picture splayed across the lock screen with no text. It was a very simple Twitter message. The manager looked up subconsciously and when he saw who had sent the Twitter message, it suddenly sobered his sleepy mind. He didn't care that Noah Hyber was still recording a song and immediately rushed in through the door. In a coffee shop, on the pedestrian street of Evanston, Anne finally found an opportunity to meet Kenneth and hand him the invitation. Tomorrow is my apprenticeship banquet hosted by the Anderson family. Anne stirred the coffee with a spoon and looked up at Kenneth, her attitude more casual than before. You should think about whether you want to return to Chicago tomorrow. The Anderson family members were new aristocrats in the capital. Recently, they had been secretly competing with the Grint family and were extremely sharp. Mr. Anderson held the second highest position in the circle. Although he only ran errands for Mr. Grint, he had indeed come to know many dignitaries and nobles thanks to Mr. Grint's reputation. In all aspects, his position was a lot higher than the Perez family. So much so that Anne's status in the family had now improved. She hurried back and left after saying a few words to Kenneth. Kenneth was deep in thought and also replied simply to Anne before she got into the Perez family's car and left. He stood at the intersection with the icy wind blowing against him until a very low-key car with a flag drove over. People at the intersection couldn't help but avoid the car when they saw it. In Evanston, one saw many luxury cars. But after staying there for a while, they found that the low-key cars with the red flag belonged to families that really couldn't be provoked. The White family didn't live in the villa area, but in an old alley. They did not open it to the public and had guards at every exit. A villa was an enormous courtyard of houses, and the older generation naturally liked to call them big residences. The area seemed wide, but there was only one house in each alley. Family members handed down their villas to heirs that hadn't waned. They parked the car in front of a large residence. The butler waiting outside came to open the car door. Kenneth handed him the invitation and walked down the corridor to the main courtyard. The butler followed three steps behind Kenneth, and when Kenneth returned to his room, he looked down and turned over the invitation. A maid passing by glanced at it and didn't recognize it. The Perez family? Anderson family? What kind of apprenticeship banquet would involve Kenneth? The butler glanced at it lightly and threw it aside. There were many invitations sent to the White family every day. They ignored them, all except for a few banquets. They had renovated the courthouse yard. The White family was relatively modern and Kenneth lived in a separate courtyard. As he sat down at his desk in front of his computer, Paul told him to go online to play games in the arena with him. Paul chose the card in the game and asked, Kenny, you're coming back to Chicago at 3 o'clock tomorrow? You all went to Evanston and left me alone in school. It's so boring. Kenneth leaned back and responded casually, Yeah. Who else came to Evanston? 
He thought of Brian. Bessie, she took the same leave as you. Paul entered the arena and summoned his cards. I was eating with Brian when he heard that Bessie went to Evanston, so he bought the latest flight that night and flew over. Kenneth asked around in the concert hall and knew that Brian had been in Mr. Grint's room, along with an unknown person. But after hearing Paul's words, he suddenly paused. Who else did you say is here from Evanston? Episode 123 Bessie is Suspicious Yeah, Brian bought the earliest ticket, Paul said and made his play. Kenneth didn't lay out a card, he just gripped the mouse and asked, What did you say? Paul scratched his head and whispered, About Bessie? Yeah, Kenneth said. They finished playing the first game. Instead of starting another round with Paul, he pulled open the drawer and took out a black USB the assistant at the concert hall had given him the last time he was there. He hired a technician to look at the surveillance content before, but the path source file was damaged and couldn't be recovered. At first, he thought little of it, but because of Paul's words, all the details seemed to align now. Kenneth took a deep breath. The butler knocked on the door. Kenneth, should I cancel your flight tomorrow? He sat the dinner tray on the table and handed the invitation card to Kenneth. Kenneth turned off his computer, walked to the dining table, and said without hesitation, No, the flight goes as usual. The butler had expected this answer. He nodded and watched from the side as Kenneth ate his dinner. After struggling for a long while, he finally said hesitantly, Did Mr. White meet a suitable successor in Chicago? Is that why he's not back yet? Kenneth paused and his eyes drooped. Who did you hear that from? The butler lowered his voice and said, I guessed it. Everything Mr. White did recently was for a successor, wasn't it? After Kenneth finished eating, he put down his fork and slowly took a napkin to wipe his hands. His voice was bitter as he said, This matter will stop here. But he didn't deny it. The butler's heart tightened as he took the tray and left the room. He stood outside the courtyard door with a faint feeling in his heart that the four quarters of the capital would soon change drastically. The next day, Bessie got up at six in the morning and packed her things. When she opened the door, Samuel was already waiting outside, but he was alone. Samuel rarely woke up this early and yawned loudly as he held the car key in his hand. Something cropped up for Michael, so he has to stay for a few more days. I won't go back, so I'll only send you to the airport. He didn't explain what issues had cropped up, and Bessie didn't ask. Nobody except Samuel knew what time she was leaving. Mr. Grint knew she was returning to Chicago today, but he didn't know the exact time. Samuel yawned again as he watched Bessie bring her boarding pass to the gate. He planned to return for a nap. Once he got in his car, Robert called him. Samuel put on his Bluetooth headset and drove the car slowly. She left? Samuel said earlier in the group chat that he was sending someone off in the morning, so Robert assumed it was Bessie. Yeah, she's leaving now. Samuel suddenly remembered something. Sherry's results are coming out today, right? Marvin and the rest have been discussing it the whole night. Robert wasn't particularly interested in this. But that Bessie is a little dishonest. Yesterday, Sebastian said he saw her and her paparazzi friend on the top floor of the lounge. But I thought about it and wondered... Can paparazzi enter the building? That night, they had been in the Heaven Lounge. It was the most upscale lounge in Evanston. Although the owner was unknown, everyone knew that the building was secretive, and those who wanted to make trouble either disappeared silently or had no context left. Stars would come to this lounge as well. So how could ordinary paparazzi safely reach the top floor? Did she think Heaven's security system and inspection efforts were just for show? Paparazzi? Samuel was clever and remembered Clarissa, whom Marvin had mentioned before. Was it the war reporter? She was still at the border a month ago. Although it surprised Robert to hear that she was a war reporter, he could still accept this answer, so he walked into the kitchen and poured a glass of milk. She's better than the musician, Mr. Grint. Both of them felt like Clarissa was too normal compared to Mr. Grint. 
Bessie's plane departed at 9 in the morning, and she arrived in Chicago at 11. She had just gotten off the plane when she received a phone call, but it wasn't a number familiar to Bessie. She answered and discovered it was Michael. He asked if she had arrived and hung up before he got an answer. Bessie looked down at the strange number in the address book and thought for a long while before deciding not to investigate it. All the mobility of information was in her hands. She would know if anyone investigated her. Last time, Daniel said that her name was on Matthew's list, but she had assured him otherwise because she received no updates that someone was investigating her. Thus, she had been a little surprised to see her name on the list. It seemed like both Michael and Samuel didn't intend to investigate her history, but that Sebastian had a lot of movements after that night. The issue didn't bother Bessie, however. If she didn't allow it, even Jared wouldn't be able to get her personal information. Bessie didn't return to school and went to the hospital first. It was lunchtime and Bertha was eating while leaning on a pillow. The nurse moved a chair beside Bertha and watched as she ate. Bessie waved her hand for the nurse to leave. She sat down on the chair and cut an apple for Bertha. Bertha had little energy and moved her spoon slowly. She looked up and tried not to be obvious as she asked, "'What did you tell Mr. Grint?' "'I don't know. I haven't thought about it.' Bessie lowered her head and played with the fruit knife in her hand before saying, "'The SAT is next year. There's no hurry.' She cut the apples into small pieces. She put it in Bertha's hand and then went to get a toothpick for her to eat the small pieces. "'Your aunt hasn't been here recently.' Bertha ate slowly while frowning. She has always been proud and never expressed it, even if something happened. That year when your mother took over your uncle's petty matter, she worked three jobs a day rather than accept money from the insurance. I'll look later when I bring Pete something. Bessie nodded irritably. Also, Bertha added, Mr. Grint is a rare and excellent teacher, and Brian isn't like Stephen. Bessie pursed her lips. She felt like Bertha was trying to convey her will to her. Bessie's emotions suddenly gathered, and she replied sharply, I don't care so much. You can care about it yourself. There was nobody else in the ward, and the doctor wouldn't come during this time so she just leaned against the table and poured out the contents of her backpack on it. She looked on silently. Bertha leaned over and saw that the box that Susan had stuffed in was amongst the pile of things on the table. Bessie reached out and picked up the wooden box. She weighed it in her hands and then raised an eyebrow, glancing at Bertha without expression. Bertha glanced at the very familiar plastic bottle and immediately looked away to eat again, not daring to look at Bessie. Once Bertha looked away, Bessie put the wooden box back in her backpack and picked up the plastic bottle. After thinking for a while, she pursed her lips and unscrewed the cap. Bertha ate faster under Bessie's watchful eye. She finished her lunch in less than half an hour and Bessie handed her a cup of warm water. She watched her finish it before helping her organize the lunchbox and then ringing the bell for the nurse to remove the tray. Mrs. Wilson, you look a lot better now that your granddaughter is here. The caregiver smiled at Bertha. It surprised the nurse to see Bertha become slightly healthier and rosier. It was no wonder that people said that pleasant events could improve one's mood. Bessie accompanied Bertha all afternoon and sat by the window reading. At five o'clock, she retrieved her backpack and left the hospital. She didn't take a taxi and waited for bus 623 at the bus stop near the hospital. It was Wednesday, and she had evening self-study. Pete rarely attended evening self-study, as it wasn't mandatory for him. Andrea always came back late at night, and Pete always helped her prepare meals and fold her clothes. Susan normally went to evening self-study every night. After Bessie left, Bertha opened her eyes and sighed. Then, she picked up her phone and called Mr. Grint. Mr. Grint, did you want to tell me something when you came to find me last time? Bertha sat up on the bed and coughed, her energy lower than usual. Mr. Grint held his phone and walked outside. I didn't have any other meaning by calling you. I just wanted to ask if Bessie's music scores are still with you. 
Yes. Bertha raised an eyebrow and remembered how serious Mr. Grint had looked at the music scores. She chuckled and said, I kept them properly for her, but what happened? Mr. Grint knew Bertha wasn't a simple person when he first met her, but he didn't expect her to be so keen. He didn't dare say more and hung up the phone after saying a friendly word to her. Bertha's eyes deepened. She leaned against the bed, her eyes flickering for a long while as she coughed into her hands. At Andrea's house, Pete opened the door and then went back to the kitchen. A minute later, he came out with a knife, his expression cold. Have you eaten? No. Bessie put her backpack on the table, dragged out a chair, and propped her legs up. Pete always cooked fast. Bessie realized he only served two portions. Andrea isn't coming back tonight? Bessie squinted slightly as she held the fork. Pete sat to the side and said in an indifferent voice, She works the night shift and will come back tomorrow morning. Andrea had always been hardworking, so Bessie had been secretly looking around for several enterprises that would give her a salary of $50,000. But she refused to go. In the end, Bessie had no other choice but to bring them things to do at home. Bessie pursed her lips and lowered her head silently. Her family was full of stubborn people. Bessie looked up and said absent-mindedly, Susan isn't coming back either? She went to Evanston. Grace called her yesterday and asked her to go to Evanston to attend the apprenticeship banquet. Mom isn't going, so she let her go instead. Pete took two bites and put down the bowl. He didn't look at Bessie from beginning to end. However, Bessie didn't notice and just put her hand on the table, sitting boldly as her mind wandered. Even if Andrea didn't plan to go, she wouldn't have let Susan go either. This was strange. After eating, Bessie threw the notebook from Luke to Pete. You met Luke? Pete's expression changed. Yeah, Bessie went to the washroom to take a shower and took her black backpack. Study well. Northwestern University is waiting for you. Pete glanced at her. You got a zero for physics. Bessie was speechless. She thought about how Pete was still the same and just carried her backpack behind her silently, opening the door directly to leave. Once Bessie left, Pete relaxed. He put the notebook to one side and then went to the kitchen to get a thermos. He filled it with soup and took the bus to a small hospital. His face was somber and his eyes dark. It was the city, so he was still nervous no matter which hospital bed it was. Pete found Andrea lying on the hospital bed in the corridor. Bandages covered her left leg. There were obvious bloodstains on it, implying the wound still required treatment. Pete stood at the end of the corridor and clenched his hands before strolling over to the bed. Pete sat next to the hospital bed and lowered his eyebrows, his voice emotionless. I'm going to borrow money from my aunt. Andrea's face was pale and the wrinkles around her eyes were obvious. She pursed her lips and said, Pete, you're not allowed to. Okay, I won't. Pete nodded. Bessie came over tonight. I think she's already suspicious. Andrea's fingers tightened after hearing this. You must conceal this matter and not let Bessie know. Because of Scarlet, she almost killed Stephen. If she knows what happened to me... She definitely won't be able to bear it, especially with her temper. Our factory director isn't from the White family. What if he uses his network to send Bessie to prison? Episode 124 Andrea's Diagnosis Andrea didn't meddle with her business, but it didn't mean she didn't understand it. She was very clear about the Smith family's attitude towards Bessie. She knew Grace had always been in an awkward position in the Smith family. She would never allow herself to drag them down. If Bessie knew why she was staying in the hospital, there would be big trouble. The machine had never been faulty, but it made a mistake when I arrived. Don't you know what kind of person our factory director is? What do we have against him? This matter... It's possible that someone is behind it. My leg has always been lame, so it's fine, even if it's broken. I just can't burden you and Bessie. Your grandpa, Andrea said faintly and grabbed Pete's arm. Her eyes were bloodshot. 
Pete, listen to me. Your sister is in Evanston, so you must hide this matter from Bessie and your grandma. You can't mention a word about me to them. Promise me. Pete loosened his clenched fists and lowered his head. I promise. He always knew his limits, so Andrea sighed in relief and leaned back. Her expression slightly relaxed. Pete, keep the things your grandma gave you. Pete scooped up a spoonful of soup and offered it to her. Andrea didn't use an analgesic pump and was in great pain. She didn't eat dinner and only drank a bit of soup. Since Pete had to go to class tomorrow morning, he caught the last bus home. At home, he put the notebooks that Bessie had brought from Evanston on the table. He sat down and reached out to flip through each of the books. They were mostly physics books and notes. There were also several physics exercise books. Pete lowered his head slightly, his eyelashes drooping and casting a shadow on his eyelids. After looking at it for a long time, he reached out and put the pile of materials in a cabinet and locked it. Bessie returned to her bedroom and took a shower. Then, she took her mobile phone to the school's printing center. You want to print it all? The associate responsible for printing asked kindly. Bessie nodded slightly, her fringe falling over her brow bone as she knocked carelessly and slowly on the table with her long and beautiful fingers. The associate in the printing center helped her print the documents one by one. Dozens of photos came out slowly. Bessie leaned aside and put down the things in her hand. She held up her phone and started reading the information about her grandma that Jared had sent her. Bessie frowned slightly at the abundance of information especially when she saw Andrea's name in the middle. Twenty minutes later, the attendant printed all the photos and Bessie looked them over carefully. She was still thinking about Andrea. The associate helped her put the photos together and asked, Did you print so many landscape photos to make postcards? Bessie responded a little slowly and stood up. It's a gift. She handed the photos to Bessie and nodded without asking more. Bessie placed them in her pocket and went to English class. The photo associate rarely saw someone who looked so good, so he slowly paced around after Bessie left before he went to play with his phone. Then, he saw a student card on the table. Brightbow High School English class, Bessie Miller. This name was familiar. It was the good-looking girl who was just in the shop. She had forgotten her ID. He chased after Bessie but didn't see her. She left so fast. The associate thought about it and still kept the card. If the girl didn't come to take it tomorrow, he would find a time to bring it to her class. Most of the people in English class were present. Kenneth had already returned by the time Bessie arrived. He held a pen and was doing some physics questions. He hadn't even completed three big questions the entire afternoon. Upon closer inspection, his eyes were in a daze. After the incident with Chloe, Bessie's popularity skyrocketed. But she hadn't come to class for three days, so she caused quite a stir when she suddenly appeared in class that night. One student called out, Bessie, do you want to play? The kind where you carry me. Another yelled, Bessie, help! I need help to get my level up. Bessie threw the photos on the table and sat down casually in her chair. Hearing the howl of the surrounding people, she raised an eyebrow leaned back in her chair, and extended a finger to knock on the table. The hustle and bustle around her dissipated instantly. Bessie withdrew her finger and took out her notebook from her backpack. She hadn't practiced writing today, and she hadn't looked at her foreign book. She pressed the paper with one hand and held a pen in her other hand. Then, she put on her headphones and refined the score in the frame. Her mobile phone lit up. Noah Hyber sent her a smiley face. She wrote with an unconstrained style, her strokes changing direction every so often. Mary couldn't understand her writing and looked away after a while to flip through the printed photos on her desk. At the back, Paul looked at Kenneth, who seemed to look in Bessie's direction. He put down his pen, poked Kenneth's back, and whispered, Kenny, what are you looking at? I checked in on Q over the last few days. He guessed it was because of Q. Ever since then, Kenneth had been strange. Kenneth turned sideways, narrowed his eyes, and asked in a low voice, Paul, do you remember Anne saying that Bessie played the violin? 
Yeah, but Bessie's violin playing isn't good, and I've never seen her practice it before. Paul didn't expect him to change the subject and only responded after a moment. Kenneth leaned back in the chair, spun his pen, and looked coldly at him. How do you know she's bad if you've never heard it before? Of course, Anne had told him. Paul scratched his head and looked carefully at Kenneth, not daring to refute him. However, Kenneth didn't intend to wait for his answer. He looked away and fell into deep thought. The apprenticeship banquet ended successfully in Evanston. Susan followed Grace and the rest of the group cautiously as she went to the Perez family's house. Because Anne had become Mr. Anderson's student, the Perez family deliberately took Grace back from the hotel to their villa and arranged a room for her beside Anne. Susan had never even seen the Smith family's house before, so the Perez family's house was simply magnificent to her. She stared intently and couldn't look away. The Perez family and the rest all noticed this, but they expressed nothing. Before going to sleep, Susan stayed in Anne's room. Grace was calling for Bertha. Grace, why is Grandma looking for you? Susan hadn't spoken to Bertha since the last incident and was a little uneasy. She was afraid of what Bertha would say to Grace. Grace put down her phone and smiled. She heard Anne became Mr. Anderson's student and specifically called to ask me to send her Anne's audition video. Anne came out of the bathroom after the shower and raised an eyebrow. Why does she want it? Wasn't Grandma always uninterested? Grace asked Bertha when Anne had been performing, but Bertha said she was sleepy and hadn't seen it. So, Grace sent a video to Andrea. She regrets it now. Grace smiled a little smugly. After knowing how impressive you are, how could she not be happy for you? She looked down and searched for the video she had recorded on her cell phone and sent it to Bertha. In the past two days, Grace finally felt like she could hold her ground in front of Elise. Anne rubbed her hair and frowned slightly, feeling like something was wrong, but she couldn't tell what. Oh, why didn't your mother come? Grace finished sending the video to Bertha and looked at Susan. She didn't open the video I sent her. Is she still working at the plastics factory this late at night? Yes, Susan nodded. She was still working when I left. Grace squinted and went outside to call Andrea. Anne knew Grace was questioning Andrea about why she hadn't spent the money she had sent her. The next day in the office. What, do you want to quit the physics competition? And you want to take 10th grade classes? The teacher held the paper for the competition in his hand and gave a stunning look at the proud student in front of him. Why? High schools all around Chicago paid attention to various competitions. Now, students could add this to their college application package if they won the third prize or above in the competitions. After the midterm exam, teachers in various subjects paid attention to the best students. Pete was the first in his grade and the scores in each of his subjects were close to that of Bessie, the evildoer. So the mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology teachers had all been trying to rope him in. In the end, he had chosen physics. In the past years, they regarded a talent like Pete as a treasure. But this year, there were a bunch of prodigies in the ninth grade. Bessie, Kenneth, and Scarlett were all talents. But even if Pete was inconspicuous, he could still compete with those ninth graders. The science class teacher stood up after hearing that he wanted to quit the physics competition and start taking advanced classes. There's no reason. Pete lowered his head, pursed his lips, and said coldly, I just don't like my class suddenly. Pete, think clearly. You have a good foundation and you might learn the contents of ninth and 10th grade yourself, but you will just be a swallow with that short period. With your qualifications, you could enter Brightbow High School as the top scorer in a few years. You don't have to do this to yourself. With that said, the teacher paused and then asked in a low voice, Did you encounter any difficulties? It's okay, just tell me directly so I can help you. Pete looked up, his eyes dark and icy as usual. Teacher, I want to take advanced classes again next year in the spring. I hope you can help me keep the physics competition secret. The teacher looked at him in the eye and sighed. I hope you can go back and think about it again or discuss it with your family. 
Thank you, teacher. Pete bowed slightly before standing upright and walking out. He heard a sigh behind him. The science class teacher went to the printing center with a worried expression. He couldn't help but tell the associate about it. After talking, he realized that the whole printing center felt cold. The teacher froze and turned his head to see a girl wearing a white sweater outside staring at him. She looked quite familiar. Sorry, but may I ask? Bessie's delicate face was expressionless as she bowed to him politely. Who did you just say withdrew from the physics competition? Her voice was serious. The teacher thought about it and remembered that she was the black horse of the ninth grade, Bessie. She was someone who even Brian bowed down to, so how could he not recognize her? It's nothing. The teacher kept silent after thinking of Pete's instructions. Bessie just smiled and nodded, as if his answer didn't satisfy her. She stepped forward, smiled politely, and asked the shop attendant, Sir, did I leave my student card here last night? Although she was smiling, her body exuded an unscrupulous sense of disagreeableness. The associate was stunned for a moment before he quickly took out Bessie's student card and handed it to her. Thank you. Bessie took the student card and left. The teacher heaved a sigh of relief. Students these days aren't easy to mess with. After school in the evening, Pete went home as usual, cooked and took the thermos to the hospital. He didn't ask for leave. Andrea was too prideful, and she would be angry if he asked to leave for her. Andrea was lying on the bed and sighed in relief when she saw Pete. Pete put down the thermos and helped her to the bathroom. As soon as they came back, they walked down the corridor and Pete froze. Andrea was stunned to see him stop. Why? She looked up and saw Bessie standing at her hospital bed, her hand holding her medical record. Bessie? Andrea gasped. Bessie took a deep breath. Even though her blood was boiling, she said in a calm voice, The diagnosis result is amputation after three days? Andrea, isn't your leg almost healed? Is amputation recommended? Why is amputation recommended? Who did this, huh? Andrea gasped. Bessie, you're here! There were many people in the corridor, and it was quite noisy. Bessie's voice wasn't abrupt and Andrea smiled as Pete helped her over to Bessie. I was careless and accidentally got my legs caught in the machine. It's nobody's fault. Bessie knew Andrea's temper well. Bessie stopped staring at her and turned to Pete, her eyes almost bloodshot. She asked, word by word, which factory was it? Episode 125 Everyone Takes Action Pete stared at Bessie silently. Andrea released Pete's grip and took two steps forward. Although she staggered, she still walked to her bed without changing her expression. Then she smiled and looked at Bessie. Look, I'm totally fine. It's okay. My leg was unfavorable to begin with. You know that. It's not a big matter if it's amputated. Not a big matter? How could Bessie not know how proud her family was? She had spent so much effort secretly watching Andrea's legs get better every day. Bessie picked up the medical record on the bed and looked at it again, before finally putting it back down. If they wouldn't tell her, she would check the results by herself. Without looking at Pete or Andrea, she reached out and stopped a nurse. Her eyes were blood red but she suppressed her anger and turned her head slightly. Excuse me, where is Dr. Amanda Lewis? The nurse stared at her blood-stained, cold eyes and felt a shudder. Um, he's in the clinic on the third floor. It's almost time for him to get off work. Thank you. Bessie nodded politely at her and then reached out to remove the sweater hood from the top of her head. Saying nothing else, she walked directly to the elevator. After she left, Andrea couldn't support herself anymore and sat down on the bed. Beads of sweat rolled down her forehead. She reached out to grab Pete's arm and looked up. Pete, chase after your cousin. Make sure she doesn't know who our factory director is. Pete helped her up and pulled at the table at the end of the bed. He set the meal in front of her and silently followed Bessie. On the third floor, 
The outpatient's office got off work earlier, but Dr. Lewis was still teaching the trainees how to intubate. After demonstrating three times, she took off her white coat and walked to the changing room. She was done with her work for the day. The moment she went out, she saw a pair of cold and sharp eyes glaring at her. Excuse me, I want to ask about the condition of the patient in bed 72. Dr. Lewis led Bessie to the hospital's office, removed Andrea's medical chart and showed it to Bessie. The patient severely damaged the bone structure and we can't preserve the leg. If we don't perform the amputation as soon as possible, the lesion will surely threaten the patient's life and health. You're the family of the patient, so you should understand that we made every decision regarding amputation with caution. Bessie's mind buzzed, and the worry lines between her eyebrows became more and more obvious. She understood every word of the diagnosis, but hadn't linked them together until the doctor explained them. I've already asked. Pete said calmly from the outside. Bessie remained motionless and didn't look at Pete. She said, Dr. Lewis, I want to transfer her to Northwestern Memorial Hospital as soon as possible. Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago had many famous doctors who had transferred over from various places recently. Patients had come from all over to receive their care. The industry knew these things. Dr. Lewis nodded. Sure, but the diagnosis will be the same. You should prepare mentally. She understood that their hospital was small and the patient's family might not be willing to accept this result. However, the diagnosis of major conditions usually remains the same. Because it involved amputation or was an emergency condition, the two hospitals could hand the case over quickly. Dr. Lewis had never made such a quick transfer before. She put on her white coat again and asked the intern nurses to check on the status of the patient. While mobilizing the information, the ambulance from Northwestern Memorial Hospital arrived. After seeking confirmation, they completed the transfer process in less than 10 minutes. The person walking in front seemed very familiar to the doctor. When the ambulance left, Dr. Lewis suddenly remembered the face of the person. It was the director of surgery at Northwestern Memorial Hospital who had written the research report in Chicago. Dr. Lewis pondered the recalled information in surprise while holding her bag. Judging by Pete and Andrea's appearance, she had thought that they were pitiful after being mistreated by the factory, but it seemed like they weren't as simple as they looked. At least the girl in the jacket who had walked with big, confident strides didn't seem like an ordinary person. Northwestern Memorial Hospital Andrea looked at the changed hospital and the single room, then at the group of doctors pouring in and was stunned. An expert consulted her. She didn't have time to think about how a high school student like Bessie had arranged this in such a short time. She struggled to sit up. Bessie, I know my legs, Andrea said. Did you find Mr. Smith? The group of experts was still whispering among themselves. Lowering her head, Bessie reached out, took off her jacket, and said in a low tone, No, I didn't find the Smith family. Andrea, don't worry about this. The experts continued discussing it. A nurse came in and put Andrea on a drip before several people pushed the bed out of the room. We're taking a sample. Can the patient's family please follow? Pete felt at ease now, but didn't expect a group of doctors to turn up. He glanced at Bessie. Don't worry. Bessie nodded at him. His trust in Bessie was strong, even when the situation was beyond his expectations. He asked a few questions and followed Andrea's hospital bed as she went to do a careful examination. Bessie didn't go with Andrea. Instead, she followed the group of experts into the office. They discussed the information they had received from Dr. Lewis for a long time. In less than an hour, the results from various precise tests came in and the result wasn't that much different from Dr. Lewis's. Amputation was still the best solution. Everyone looked at Bessie, who was sitting farthest away from the conference table. Bessie. She laid her hand on the table and held her phone in the other. She stared at the medical information, lying on the table at her side. Wait. Bessie was deep in thought. She stood up and walked towards the only doctor in the office who was holding the computer chart for comparison. Lend me your computer. This was a computer notebook, but the doctor still handed it over. 
Looking down, Bessie pressed a string of codes with her fingers and directly connected to Daniel's private account. In less than a minute, his slightly delicate face appeared on the computer screen. He was leaning against a yacht as the wind blew across his clothes. I'm on vacation. What's the matter? The sea was windy, and Daniel raised his voice, afraid she might not hear him. He pulled out a white earphone from his pocket and put it on. The yacht's light reflected on his face. Doctor, can you tell him what you just told me? Bessie pursed her lips and turned the computer to face the group of doctors. The doctor in the office looked at the screen and was very shocked to see an extremely young face. However, they all reported the patient's medical condition and the various data they had accumulated. Daniel felt something was wrong after hearing Bessie's voice. He walked to a spot on the yacht without wind and his expression turned grave. The blood vessels on her thighs are beyond repair. I recently studied a coagulation drug in the Middle East, but I couldn't repair it. You know, I'm not a surgeon. I'm an authority on viruses, infections, diseases, endemic diseases, and human organs, and I study the bacteriology of cellular viruses. I can only help suppress the spread of the bacteria and make sure the patient is stable enough for the operation. Her leg will be paralyzed, but the situation isn't so severe that she requires amputation. Daniel shook his head slowly, but after hearing him, the surgeons present couldn't help but interrupt the frivolous face in the video. Excuse me, sir? Who are you? Andrea's condition wasn't good and the new round of results showed amputation. But this man said he could suppress the bacterial lesions. Bacteria had always been an uncontrollable problem in the medical field because so many bacteria are ever-changing, and there were millions of bacteria strains that hadn't yet been studied in the world. They could only be collectively called bacterial colonies. Me? I'm a wandering doctor. They expelled me from school and I'm not a very important person. Daniel said slowly, then said to Bessie after thinking for a while, There's someone. Forget it. I'll be there tomorrow. He went on a trip according to his plan. Since Bessie said he didn't need to visit Bertha, he rewarded himself with a vacation after traveling for three months of work. Bessie hung up. Most of Andrea's examination results were out, but Bessie didn't go back to the ward. She stood outside the hallway after leaving the office. Seeing how Pete and Andrea were concealing it so strongly, there had to be an inside story. Her hands shook, and she dialed Officer Gomez's number. After a long time, he picked up the call. Officer Gomez only heard Bessie's undulated voice as she said, Help me investigate something. See if there were any plastics factories where a worker had recently been injured. I want to see all of them. Episode 126 Progress in the Investigation it was almost 8 o'clock in the evening. Officer Gomez left work earlier after handing the finishing details of Poison Wolf to Harvey. When he received a call from Bessie, he was reading the details of previous cases. Factory? Okay. Officer Gomez put down the case in his hand, reached for the coat hanging on one side, and walked outside. What happened? In such industrial injury cases, most factories would choose to cover up the truth. Since Bessie was looking into it, then apparently no one had reported the incident. He would send people to investigate it. Fortunately, Officer Gomez's team was the best in such matters. Something happened. Let's meet at our old place. Bessie hung up the phone. She squeezed her fists and stood in the corner to calm herself down before entering Andrea's ward. Andrea had already returned to her bed. Bessie? Andrea was still in a daze and thought Bessie had gone to beg the Smith family, but Bessie denied it. Just now, those experts. After receiving medicine and an analgesic pump, Andrea looked much better than before. She didn't understand how Bessie could have brought those experts here without the Smith family. Aunt, don't worry about it. Bessie stood by the bed and looked down at Andrea's leg. I won't let them amputate your leg. She didn't wait for Andrea's response. She picked up her jacket and glanced at Pete expressionlessly. Come out with me. Bessie went out first. Pete pursed his lips and stood up. He was about to turn around when Andrea grabbed the corners of his clothes. She widened her eyes silently and shook her head, instructing Pete not to tell her anything. 
I know, Pete said coldly. Bessie stopped at the end of the corridor and leaned against the wall. She turned slightly when Pete came out and crossed her arms. Her face remained expressionless. Pete walked to her silently. Bessie didn't turn around to look at Pete. She only asked, You withdrew from the competition? Pete looked up, pursed his lips and responded after a long time. Yeah. Okay, Bessie nodded. A caregiver will take care of her. You should go home later. You still have class tomorrow. I won't go in anymore. Pete watched as Bessie pressed the elevator button and went downstairs before heading back to the ward. Bessie shouldn't be able to find the location of the factory. Andrea heaved a sigh of relief after hearing Pete's report. Her factory director had social connections, after all. It would be difficult for a high school student like Bessie to find him. But Andrea widened her eyes and still couldn't fall asleep, worrying that Bessie wouldn't give up. That year, Scarlett's incident had left a deep impression in her heart. Pete, go to the plastics factory tomorrow and find the director. Tell him we'll settle privately and say that I agree to the compensation terms. Andrea pursed her lips and looked at Pete. Pete paused after hearing this and responded after a while. Okay. At half past eight in the evening, Bessie was at a restaurant inside a private room. Bessie didn't sit down, but leaned against a chair. She made a call to Daniel. I haven't reached the pier yet. Daniel stood at the bow and watched the cruise ships head towards the pier at full speed. I'm on the high seas. It will take a while more. He didn't purchase the ship. It was a personal item given to him by a smuggler whom he had saved before. There was a sign on it, and no ship dared to approach him. Okay, Bessie nodded. I forgot to mention that Robert is in Chicago. Be careful when you get off the plane. He's lingering around, isn't he? Daniel's face turned dark after hearing this name. Okay, I'll keep an eye out. They hung up. Someone knocked on the door. Bessie put her phone down and said, Come in. Officer Gomez entered while instructing his subordinate about what to do at the plastics factory. He saw Bessie the moment he entered. She was looking sideways out the window. She turned her head when she heard him and pressed her cigarette into the ashtray on the table. Her fingertips seemed cold as she gestured. Sit. She pointed to the chair opposite her. Officer Gomez frowned, put his phone down, and waited for Bessie to speak. The wind at night was strong, and the smoke in the room had dissipated. She reached out to close the window and explained the situation briefly. It's simple. Officer Gomez, who had been extremely worried along the way, finally relaxed. He picked up the menu, ordered a few dishes, and then promised her. Don't worry, I will find this factory for you. Who has such big nerves to provoke you? If this matter was just an ordinary report, and the other party hid it after hearing about the investigation, it might be impossible to find. But with Officer Gomez, nothing was impossible. He and his team were fast. In an inappropriate description, the Chicago branch of the CIA was simply too powerful regarding such a small matter. Bessie had found Officer Gomez because of this. She narrowed her eyes, looked down at the glass in her hand, and said, I also want to know who is seeking his death. Early the next morning, in the school's medical office, as a school doctor, Samuel naturally couldn't leave his job for too long. He had arrived the day before and sat in his chair watching as Michael entered through the door. Have you seen Bessie? Michael yawned and said vaguely, I don't know. I haven't seen her. I called her yesterday, but she didn't answer. Samuel said, I told Marvin to go to the school and see if he could find out something. Michael had on a black shirt with a beige windbreaker draped over his arm. He was a little lazy. He threw the windbreaker on the sofa and looked up to snort in response when he heard Samuel. Before long, Marvin returned. I asked Bessie's deskmate and she said Bessie took leave. Marvin arrived carrying a lunchbox, and Harvey followed behind him. Michael? Harvey greeted him respectfully before frowning. Bessie isn't here. Why are they always so busy? Michael dragged a chair out from the table and sat down with his legs casually propped up. After hearing Harvey, he poured a glass of water for himself and turned around. Who else is busy? Officer Gomez, I went to ask his technical staff for help with an extensive database. 
but when I arrived this morning, one of them informed me their entire team was out on a mission. Harvey sat down on the other side and frowned. Thus, he hoped Bessie would be available to help him analyze it. But Marvin had told him Bessie was on leave before he even reached the school doctor's office. Officer Gomez dispatched his entire team? Samuel put down the case that hadn't been sorted out for several days and looked over it in surprise. Did Poison Wolf move again in the days since we left? Officer Gomez's team moved meticulously. The entire criminal investigation community recognized them for their work. They viewed Officer Gomez's ability as stellar, but several people on his team were extremely famous in the criminal investigation community. Otherwise, Harvey wouldn't have traveled thousands of miles to find Officer Gomez in Chicago. Harvey might not have been able to hire Officer Gomez regarding Poison Wolf if it hadn't been for Bessie playing the middleman. But now, the entire team had been dispatched. Was something big happening in Chicago? No, I've already cleaned up their remnants. Harvey shook his head and stared at Marvin's breakfast before taking a bite out of a bun. That's why I find it so strange. Officer Gomez remained to himself and seldom talked to others, except for Bessie. Harvey didn't understand what was going on and he couldn't find out from Officer Gomez either, so he just put it in the back of his mind. He turned to look at Marvin. What happened to your idol's application for 129? I heard there was a big movement this year. It was an era of network connection, but some news only circulated in the inner circle of Evanston. Ordinary people didn't know the existence of 129. Harvey had been busy cleaning up the remnants and paid little attention to what was happening in the capital. Of course, the person who set the question this year already caused a sensation. Marvin had always been expressionless, but now his tone was excited. Michael leaned against the back of his chair and ate nothing. He just casually took a sip from a bottle of orange juice and poked a straw in calmly. He cast his gaze downward and pondered everything for a minute. Suddenly, he looked up and raised an eyebrow. No. The three people looked over when they heard him speak. What's wrong? Michael put down his drink and reached out to knock on the table before glancing at Harvey. Are you sure that nothing major happened in Chicago? Of course, otherwise Rick would look for me. Harvey was certain. Officer Gomez's actions didn't just shock us. Rick asked me this morning if the matter regarding Poison Wolf had changed. Rick was the head of the government in Chicago and had contributed financially and physically to Poison Wolf last time. Since they were all from Evanston, Harvey had also worked under Rick before. If something were to happen in Chicago, the first person Rick would find was Harvey, not Officer Gomez. Michael stood up and frowned slightly before picking up his phone to call Bessie and heading outside. This time, Bessie picked it up quickly. Samuel didn't understand him. Michael, aren't you eating? Harvey had yet to understand, but after seeing Michael's actions, the realization flashed through his mind. No wonder. Officer Gomez's entire team wasn't an ordinary criminal investigation team. They wouldn't hand normal cases to him, but Harvey was clear about one thing. Bessie. Officer Gomez's attitude towards Bessie was very special. It would make sense if Gomez dispatched the entire team for Bessie. I just don't know what happened, Bessie. Harvey muttered before falling silent. Samuel looked up after hearing Bessie's name. He put down his fork and remembered that Bessie had taken leave and hadn't answered his call yesterday afternoon. Marvin, look after the school doctor's office. I'll go find Michael. Samuel couldn't sit still and put down his fork with a frown. Marvin nodded. Harvey thought for a while and then went out with his cell phone to call Rick. Of course, these people didn't know that Officer Gomez had made such a big movement for only a plastics factory. Northwestern Memorial Hospital Bessie was afraid that Bertha would become suspicious, so she went directly to Andrea's ward without visiting Bertha. When she went in, Andrea was still on a drip. A group of doctors was doing routine rounds. Bessie stood aside and waited for the doctors to finish their rounds before she approached. She glanced around the room and asked, Where's Pete? He stayed with me last night and I told him to go back home. Andrea moved a little and watched as the doctors left. 
Bessie, those doctors. Andrea, don't lie to me. Bessie pursed her lips and took two steps forward. Is Pete really at home? He's in school if he's not at home. Andrea smiled. Bessie's phone rang, and she took it out to look at it to see that it was Officer Gomez. She glanced at Andrea and didn't avoid it this time. She simply provided Andrea's room number and told him to come over before hanging up. Andrea listened uneasily. In less than 15 minutes, Officer Gomez carried a pile of documents inside. The night before, he heard Bessie explain Andrea's condition, so he wasn't surprised when he greeted Andrea. He saw Bessie wasn't avoiding it, so he directly handed the portfolio to her. Bessie, this is the information on the Capital Plastics Factory. Bam! A string in Andrea's heart snapped. She didn't have time to think about how Bessie had found out about the Capital Plastics Factory so quickly. She sat up violently and hurriedly said in a high-pitched voice, Bessie, listen to me. Don't go. My director wanted a part of my recipe, but I wasn't willing to give it to him. The machine malfunctioned and trapped my leg inside, but he only gave me a warning. My factory director has a lot of connections. He's the person who can silently cover a person's death because of a machine malfunction as a work injury. She released a long sigh and continued. My leg was already useless. It's fine if it's amputated. This man is so cruel, so he definitely won't leave any evidence. Don't act impulsively because of me. It's not worth it. Bessie nodded after hearing this. She didn't expect there to be such ruthless people in Chicago who deliberately made someone handicapped, just as a warning. She licked her lips and turned to Officer Gomez. Did you hear that? Episode 127 Bessie Takes Action Bessie could already imagine the scene. Officer Gomez didn't have time to think about what recipe Andrea was talking about. He did this line of work for a long time, and saw all kinds of arrogant people. He also couldn't take it anymore and felt the anger roll in his chest, nearly igniting the surrounding air. Yes, I heard. Officer Gomez smiled, but the smile didn't reach his eyes, as he said. He's quite bold and arrogant. The exchange of words made Andrea terrified. Andrea, where did Pete go? Bessie returned the file to Officer Gomez and asked, slowly and with a fiery tone. Andrea was silent. Then, a clear voice from outside the door called. He's at home. Michael leaned against the doorframe and said in a dull voice, It's as expected. He's probably negotiating with the people over there. It was as Bessie expected. Her expression was solemn as she looked at Andrea. Andrea, just stay here and relax. Then, she turned to Officer Gomez and said bluntly, Let's go. Andrea grabbed onto the bedsheets. Bessie, what are you two doing? Don't be impulsive. Relax, I will not be impulsive. Bessie didn't look back. Impulsive? Even if 129 didn't take part, Officer Gomez would make sure they didn't run away. She left with Officer Gomez. Michael didn't follow them. Having Officer Gomez go into the non-influential plastics factory was already overkill. He just walked to Andrea's bed and reached for Andrea's medical record. He leaned slightly against the head of the bed and flipped through it, frowning slightly. No wonder she was so angry. After thinking for a moment, he took out his phone and made a call. He turned to Andrea and greeted the woman on the other end politely. Hello, Miss Watson. He paused and continued to explain in a warm voice. The man on his way to your factory now is Officer Gomez, the captain of the Chicago branch of the CIA. He's one of the top three captains in the domestic criminal investigation industry. Do nothing to warn your factory director. Even the landlord supporting him won't be able to avoid him. As Andrea watched Michael, she remembered thinking this man looked good and was polite when she saw him in Bertha's ward last time. Now that she heard what he said, she was stunned. Of course, she had heard of the CIA. But she didn't understand everything. Captain? When did Bessie get to know him? Andrea remained frozen in place. She heard someone knock respectfully on the door. Michael turned, bent over slightly, and hung the medical record chart on the bed again before saying calmly, Come in. In a flash, a bunch of doctors came in. 
Andrea remained stunned. She watched as more doctors than yesterday entered the ward. Their attitudes rigorous and respectful, and upon closer inspection, even a little fanatic. The doctor in front was a little old, and there was a name tag with the word director written on it. Was he Northwestern Memorial Hospital's director? Report the specific details to me. When Michael reached out, the dean immediately handed him a pile of information. Michael took it and glanced at it. He flipped through it quickly and occasionally glanced at Andrea. He finished the 12-page report within three minutes. Then he returned the information to the director and remained deep in thought. Someone handed him a white surgical gown immediately. The consultation is ready and we have checked the patient's physical condition. We will take her to the 22nd floor in 20 minutes. Michael put on the white coat, buttoned it up with one hand and walked out without hesitation. He gave instructions calmly, but his movements were quick. He wasn't as lazy as before. Andrea was still stunned when they pushed her into the operating room. You, are you going to amputate it? No, a nurse with a blue mask said softly. Miss Watson, don't be afraid. With Dr. Davis here, even if your legs are twisted, he will make you stand up once more. Bessie told her last night that despite her assertion, they wouldn't amputate her leg. Today, the nurse said that she would jump around in a lively manner. Coupled with the information on Officer Gomez, Andrea was completely stunned to find out she wouldn't lose her leg as she went under anesthesia. Pete's family lived in an old community building. It was on the sixth floor and there wasn't an elevator. Many people lived in the building. Two black vans sat parked out front. Officer Gomez stopped the car and pressed his phone again. Has everyone evacuated from the Capitol Plastics Factory? He exited the car and told his men where Pete's house was. Bessie exited from the other door. She was looking down, her eyes bloodshot and extremely cold. Bessie often went to the West family's house, so most of the neighbors knew her. An elderly woman who just returned from the vegetable market saw Bessie going upstairs and immediately stopped her. Little girl, don't go up. A group of people just went up to find your cousin and they even have tattoos on their bodies. They looked fierce. She tugged on her sleeves and Bessie lowered her head to look at the turbid eyes of the worried grandmother before taking a breath. Thank you, ma'am. I'll look from outside and leave. Officer Gomez hung up his phone. They set off at about the same time as us and found a surveillance video at the Capitol Plastics Factory, but it was already destroyed. They'll be here in 10 minutes. Bessie nodded. Send the surveillance video to my phone. Even if they smashed the surveillance video, she could still restore it. Bessie and Gomez talked as they went upstairs. The old woman stood behind them for a long while, then shook her head and left with a sigh. On the sixth floor, 50,000, it's compensation for your mother. A middle-aged man with a tattoo on his fat face took a puff of his cigarette and glanced at the person beside him. The person immediately threw a small pile of money on the table. There were a bunch of black-clothed men in the room with their sleeves rolled up, revealing tattoos on their arms. Pete didn't look at the money and just stared at the bearded man intensely. Did you guys do it on purpose? The bearded man sneered at Pete, but before he could speak, the sound of the door unlocking interrupted him. Who could it be? The bearded man and his subordinates couldn't help but look outside. Pete thought of someone, and his expression changed as he darted his eyes to the door. Andrea's key had been taken by Bessie when she left. So she immediately opened the door and entered the house with Officer Gomez. Her sweater hood lay on her shoulders instead of covering her head. Today, she had changed into a black coat and wasn't wearing her usual jacket. Her beautiful eyes narrowed and swept across everyone in the room. Her gaze was void of surprise or any other emotion. She pulled on the brim of her hood, covering her bloodshot eyes. The bearded man's eyes lit up when he saw Bessie. Officer Gomez stepped in front of her and blocked the gaze of the bearded man. Now that Gomez was in the house, the bearded man dropped his tough guy attitude. Instead, he kindly answered Pete's question. Of course, it was deliberate. Young lad, don't be so angry. Having an incident in the factory is a simple matter. Pete pursed his lips and dug his fingernails into his palm. 
He knew it was a lie. He looked up and engraved the bearded man's face deep in his mind. Aren't you afraid I will call the police? Pete asked with a hoarse voice. As if he had just heard a joke, the bearded man shook his head, huffed a short laugh and answered, Do you think I will let you guys get the surveillance videos? Without it, who knows if you're just fabricating false information to get compensation. Your mother was already handicapped. We will spread it online. Everyone will accuse your mother of committing fraud for the compensation. Who do you think is the unlucky one? Hearing this, Pete's hands trembled. Don't be so angry. The bearded man smiled and knocked his heavy ringed finger on the table. If you want to report the case, go ahead. But of course, whether it succeeds is yet to be seen. He turned and stared at Bessie before squinting. Is this your sister? He didn't care about unimportant people like Pete and Andrea at all. He had only crippled Andrea's leg as a warning and also because he didn't like her. Pete's heart tightened when he saw the bearded man lay eyes on Bessie. Wait, I'll give you the things, then you can leave. He went back to his room, took out a piece of yellowed paper and passed it to the bearded man. You're indeed smarter than your mother. The bearded man took the paper in Pete's hand and his eyes lit up. If only your mother was as tactful as you, she wouldn't need to suffer like this. He lit up a cigarette and opened the paper to look at it carefully. The longer he looked at it, the greedier his appearance became. He folded the paper neatly and placed it in his pocket. Pete reached out and pointed to the door with pleading eyes. Can you go now? Go? The bearded man nodded. Of course I can go. He took two steps towards Bessie. Something wicked flashed across his eyes. But your sister has to come with me. Pete took two swift steps forward. The veins on his face bulged in anger. How dare you? The bearded man ignored Pete and instructed a couple of his goons. Grab these two men. His subordinates immediately subdued Pete and Officer Gomez. The cell phone in Bessie's pocket rang. She looked down and saw that it was Daniel. Have you arrived? She asked without showing urgency. Daniel got out of the taxi wearing large black sunglasses. Northwestern Memorial Hospital, right? Which ward? Bessie gave him the number of Andrea's room and added, Someone is there. Be careful. She was naturally referring to Harvey, Marvin, and Samuel. Daniel chuckled casually. Relax. After hanging up, Bessie looked around the room and saw that everyone was looking at her. Even the bearded man seemed surprised. Bessie's voice was calm and her tone didn't change at all when she talked, as if she was discussing the weather. Did she not show the urgency of the situation or was she just stupid? The bearded man paused before stepping forward, but Bessie dodged him and walked towards the table. She threw the money on the table onto the ground, then pulled out a chair and sat down. She lowered her head, opened her cell phone, and pulled up the surveillance video that she had just received. What are you doing? The bearded man asked, still stunned at her odd actions. These people weren't professionals, and their techniques were lousy. Bessie recovered the video quickly. She leaned back in the chair and answered, If you want to know, come over here and look. The bearded man stared at her. Although she had an extremely glamorous face, the look upon it exuded a sense of fatal danger. He walked over and looked down at the screen of the phone. It showed the surveillance video of the accident scene that he had thought was destroyed. The video vividly showed him working with several employees to tamper with the machine Andrea used. The bearded man's expression changed and he reached out to grab Bessie's phone. But Bessie was a step quicker than him and immediately pulled it away. She looked down calmly and closed the phone. She pulled off her sweater hood before removing the black rubber band from her wrist to tie up the hair that was scattered all over her shoulders. She turned her attention to Officer Gomez and said, I have received sufficient evidence. Can I start now? Harvey and Aunt Gabriel couldn't find Officer Gomez anywhere. However, they heard Michael was at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and Bessie's aunt was in trouble. The two of them received a room number from the director. Harvey told Samuel to come with him and they drove over to Northwestern Memorial Hospital. He wanted to know what happened that made the entire CIA make such a big move. The royal blue car stopped in front of the hospital. 
a taxi pulled up behind them. A man in white casual clothes got out. He wore a pair of wide black sunglasses on his nose bridge, which couldn't cover how delicate and defined his face was. Samuel put his hands in his pocket and glanced around randomly while waiting for Harvey to park the car. Suddenly, he paused. Episode 128 Chicago is Lively What's wrong? Harvey asked when he saw Samuel frozen in place. Samuel withdrew his gaze and turned around to whisper to him. That guy with the sunglasses, do you know him? People protected Daniel's personal information, especially over the past few years, so it wasn't easy to get a picture of him. But Robert had one. It was an earlier picture of Daniel, but Robert couldn't find any news about him in recent years. He showed Samuel the picture before. Samuel was playing games and didn't pay special attention to the person. The glimpse he took left an impression. Daniel's face resembled that of a celebrity who most people couldn't easily forget. His style was also unique and obvious. Harvey had never seen Daniel's picture, so he glanced over and asked, No, is he a celebrity? Samuel shook his head and said nothing. He felt too uncertain about it. Robert had used countless human resources to search for him in the Middle East without results. So how could it possibly be him here in Chicago? Was Robert being too desperate? Despite this thought, Samuel still took out his phone and sent a message to Robert. Daniel asked Bessie for Andrea's room number. He found it easily. However, he found the room empty and the door opened. Daniel took off his sunglasses and reached out to stop a nurse. Excuse me, where is the person staying in this room? He pointed in the direction of the room and smiled. The nurse looked at his face and was stunned for a moment before stammering. She's in the operation room on the 22nd floor. Operation room? Daniel paused and asked quietly. Amputation? The nurse shook her head, her expression slightly excited. It's recovery surgery. I heard that Dr. Davis took the lead. The nurse wasn't clear about the other details. Okay, thank you. Daniel turned to the side and let the nurse leave. He placed a cap on his head before heading to the underground parking lot to wait for Bessie. Twenty minutes later, the group of investigators returned to the police station and Pete and Bessie went to the hospital. They only discovered that Andrea was in the operating room when they left the West family's house. Pete went directly to the operating room on the 22nd floor and Bessie went to the underground parking lot. Daniel was leaning against the wall in the corner. It was too dark to see his face. He took off his sunglasses and raised an eyebrow as he said, I wanted to tell you last time that if he found Michael, he might save your aunt, but that guy isn't easy to invite. Who knew that a medical team pushed your aunt into the operating room by the time I arrived? Bessie pulled her sweater hood onto her head again, exposing only her delicate white jaw. After hearing Daniel, she pursed her lips and hopped onto the hood of the car next to him. So there's hope of recovery for my aunt's leg. If you had stayed in the International Medical Department before, you wouldn't have had such doubts. Daniel walked forward and sat side by side with Bessie on the hood of the car. He turned and chuckled. He's famous in the International Medical Department. Every year, countries send representatives from the International Medical Department to take part in medical exchanges. Students do as well. It was a few years ago when domestic medicine was still relatively backward and it was the first time they joined the National Science Department. They looked down on the students that attended, and the doctors there didn't even bother pointing out their problems. They just half-heartedly told them to follow the foundation rules. Michael had taken the 10 centimeter thick medical code and blocked the entrance of the laboratory. They were all new students, and they were basically on the same level. Michael was also a new student, and he did nothing. He sat at the door of the laboratory while politely challenging the foreign students. These new students weren't too concerned about Michael. They just looked around curiously, pointed at the new instruments, and asked if anyone knew what they were. At first, they didn't care about Michael's provocation. Finally, the doctors invited the academician over and stopped Michael. After that time, the International Science Department changed, and those doctors completely lost their pride. 
Was your aunt's leg injury because of an accident or someone's evil doing? Daniel asked. He hadn't mentioned to Bessie that he could tell something was wrong because the situation had been too urgent, so he didn't ask and just hurried over. Someone did it, Bessie said, narrowing her eyes. Do you need my help? No, I'll settle it. Bessie stood up and reached up to pull her hat over her head. Find a place to stay first. Since you're already here, I'll take you to see my grandma soon. On the 22nd floor, when Bessie arrived, Samuel was with Harvey. Doctors and nurses rushed to and from the operating room. Pete pursed his lips tightly and glanced at Bessie, then lowered his head and continued standing there. The atmosphere was solemn. Samuel touched his earrings. It was rare that he didn't interject and just comfort Bessie. At 1 p.m., the operating room doors burst open. Michael came out first. He pulled the mask down with one hand and unbuttoned his white coat with the other. Samuel leaned against the wall and looked at his phone in boredom. When he saw Michael come out, he stood upright and said, Michael, how's the situation? Everyone in the corridor looked at Michael in anticipation of his answer. Michael swept his eyes across the corridor and stared at the thin black figure at the end before mumbling. The operation was successful. Pete's tight heart finally relaxed. He slid down weakly along the wall and sat on the floor. Within two minutes, the doctor pushed Andrea's bed out. Her eyes were closed and her face was pale. She was still asleep because of the anesthetic, and her left leg was wrapped in white gauze tightly so that they could see no trace of blood. Bessie came over and confirmed Andrea's condition. Her heart relaxed. Then she turned and looked at Michael, her voice low and hoarse. Thank you. Michael threw the white lab coat to a nurse and looked down at the new piece of data handed to him. He raised an eyebrow and returned two words slowly to Bessie. You're welcome. Bessie and Pete went to the room and waited for Andrea to wake up. Samuel and Harvey were outsiders, and it wasn't convenient to follow them inside. Michael held a seminar with a group of doctors after the operation, mainly so that he could help them answer their questions. I heard that someone did this on purpose, Harvey said directly to Officer Gomez. He turned and stared at Samuel. He couldn't help but ask, Who could be out to harm an ordinary middle-aged woman? She was already handicapped. It made little sense. Samuel leaned back, turned his phone around in his hand, and shook his head. I'm not sure. His phone vibrated. Harvey reminded Samuel to look at his phone. Samuel looked down and saw several messages from Robert. One reads, I used so many human resources to turn the whole Middle East upside down, and yet I couldn't even find Daniel's shadow. How could you randomly bump into him in Chicago? Another one read, Monitor him, I'll be there tonight. Daniel seemed to hide more successfully than before. In the past, Robert could figure out his general whereabouts, but recently, he couldn't seem to pinpoint a location at all. Thus, Robert did everything he could to ask Michael to help him investigate. Now, Samuel said he saw someone in Chicago who looked like Daniel. In the past, Robert wouldn't have believed him, but since he couldn't find any news of Daniel at all, he was curious. Even if Samuel only glimpsed him from behind. Samuel put his hand on the car and stared at Robert's message before sighing. Robert was due to arrive that night. If Daniel was really in Chicago, then Chicago would soon become lively. Northwestern Memorial Hospital In the VIP ward Over the past two days, Bertha was in better spirits than before. The nurse helped her pour a glass of water and smiled. I haven't seen your grandson in a while. Yes. Bertha held her scraped and scratched mobile phone in one hand and watched a video on it. When she heard the nurse mention Pete, she squinted and smiled gently. He just called me the day before yesterday to tell me he's taking part in a physics competition, so he has to study. Violin music sounded in the room. The nurses were used to it now. Bertha would watch the video whenever she was free. The nurse handed the glass of water to Bertha and praised her heartily. Your granddaughter plays the violin so well. Bertha took a sip of water and turned to look at the nurse. The emotion in her voice was filled with pride. 
You also think it's nice, don't you? The nurse laughed and put the cup back in place before confessing. Of course. Once the nurse left, Bertha's eyes returned to the video on the phone. It was Anne's violin performance sent by Grace. Her countenance drooped. After a long while, she closed her eyes and turned off the video. She took out her phone and called Grace with trembling hands. Episode 129 Grandma Exposes Anne Grace was still in Evanston when she received Bertha's call. Anne received her apprenticeship with her future studies suspended for the time being. Meanwhile, Grace had arranged food and accommodation for her, along with various contacts to help her learn the violin. Anne wasn't from the Perez family, so it wasn't good for her to stay in their house for a long time. David directly transferred a sum of money to Grace and asked her to rent an apartment near Mr. Anderson's residence. It was a gift for Anne. It wasn't cheap to rent an apartment in Evanston, so David spent a lot of money on her. Grace was busy with these matters recently. She was a little surprised to receive a call from Bertha. Bertha rarely called anyone, but she seemed to be a little more diligent recently. On the phone, Bertha asked, When are you coming back? Mom, did something happen? Where's Andrea? I can't go back. Grace was stunned and glanced at Elise and Anne, who were looking at the house before lowering her voice. Anne was just accepted by Mr. Anderson, so she has to stay in Evanston for a while. I'm worried about her. I have to tell you. Bertha coughed. Her eyes were deep, but her voice was gentle. Find time to come back as soon as possible. Then she hung up the call. Grace frowned and stood by the window with her phone. After thinking for a while, she called Andrea, but she didn't answer. What's wrong? Anne finished looking around and approached Grace when she noticed her strange appearance. Grace frowned. Your grandma told me to go back. For what? I don't know. I'll go back tomorrow to see her. Grace put away her phone, feeling uneasy. That night at the Chicago airport, Marvin spent a day in the school doctor's office and drove Michael's car to pick up Robert. Robert, why did you suddenly come to Chicago? Chairperson Soup forced Robert to take over the Soup's business in recent months. He flipped through his emails and answered with a smile. I'm looking for someone. Daniel? Marvin asked, stunned. Yeah, Robert answered lightly. Marvin almost stepped on the wrong pedal. He's in Chicago? Why were they coming to Chicago one by one? What kind of treasure was there in Chicago? Marvin drove the car back to the villa. Samuel was leaning on the sofa and holding a pillow in his hand while resting one leg on the table. When he saw Robert, he raised an eyebrow. You're fast. Marvin walked in behind Robert with a stony face. How could he not be fast regarding Daniel? Robert sat on the other side and glanced around, but he didn't see Michael. Where's Michael? Simons brought Robert a cup of tea. Michael just returned from the hospital and is taking a shower upstairs. Robert nodded. He thought it was strange. Wasn't his surgery for the month already done? Did he make an exception this month? Simons shook his head. How could he possibly know the details of Michael's matters? It's Bessie's aunt. Samuel lowered his leg and grabbed a piece of pastry. She was working in the plastics factory when her leg got injured by the machine she was using. Come to think of it, Harvey, don't you find it strange? Her aunt worked in a plastics factory? All right, but what kind of formula did the factory director want from her? Hearing this, Harvey also shook his head and thought it was strange. Marvin was no longer surprised. Bessie's friends were so diverse, from field reporters to the mayor of Chicago to the backbone of the CIA. If she had a little aunt with some weird formula in her hand, it was not strange in comparison. Michael finished his shower and rolled down his sleeves before walking downstairs. Robert picked up his fork at the dining table. Michael, can you give me a list of the trips to and from Chicago today? Ever since ancient times, clothing, food, housing, and transportation had been the top priorities and the most expensive industries. 
Those four giants occupied the time and attention of those in the U.S. There was an additional giant these days, the IT section. These five giants were involved in other countries and held a substantial presence, especially in the domestic field. Some people speculated that the World Poker Tour directly occupied the IT sector and two continental plates, but these ordinary people didn't know or understand the affairs of these giants. People like Robert didn't know what social connections Michael had, but he was someone who could converse with the giants. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to get Clarissa back from the border so quickly. Finding Michael was easier when looking for a list. Michael stared at him and squinted slightly without speaking. Robert took a bite and sighed. Michael, just take pity on me. If I can't find Daniel, my old boss will abuse me. Look at how many big bosses are supporting Daniel's back, but I'm all alone. Michael pulled out a chair, sat down and raised an eyebrow. Someone will send it to you later. Robert's spirit suddenly rose. Michael held his fork in one hand and sent a message on his phone in the other. Within 20 minutes, Robert received a vast database of information on his mobile phone. He finished his meal in a hurry and asked Simons to get him a computer. Of course, Robert couldn't check this huge amount of information by himself, so he sent it to his group of men, too. Chicago was a city and there were tens of thousands of people flowing in and out daily, so it took a long time for them to check and screen everyone. Three o'clock in the morning. Robert received the results from his subordinate. Where? Robert asked. The answer shocked him. He walked to the sofa and poured himself a glass of water. His subordinate gave him a name. Isaiah Carter. The most similar person he could find after looking for Michael an entire night was Isaiah Carter. God damn it, Isaiah. No matter how good-mannered Robert was, he couldn't help but want to throw his phone. In the middle of the night, he knocked rapidly on Samuel's door. When Samuel opened, he offered Robert a chair, which he refused. He asked in a calm voice, Do you have the URL of the Hacker League? He would find Daniel even if he had to dig through the entire city of Chicago. The next day was Saturday. It was time to visit Bertha. Bessie got up early and went downstairs to see Andrea first. She looked much better than yesterday. Pete didn't return home the night before, but he moved a table and chair over to Andrea's hospital room. A black laptop sat on the table, which was a gift from Bessie when he got the top spot in his exam. When Bessie arrived, he was typing on the keyboard with a book of phrases in his hand. Are you doing a translation? Bessie walked over and stood behind him and found he was translating a very complicated foreign medical paper that involved many professional terms. Pete raised his head and stood up. The fringe of his hair covered his dark eyes. Yes, Luke sent it to me. He was a Russian to English translator, and because of the specialty involved in the field, his pay was higher than the average person in his profession. He received $100 per thousand words. Luke gave him professional articles of 17,000 words or more. Pete had been doing translation for a long time, but since this was the first time he received such professional translations, he also found it more difficult than usual. Mom is still sleeping. Pete's voice was very soft as he put everything away. I'll go up to visit Grandma with you. Andrea's incident came suddenly, and now that Bertha seemed to be better, neither of them wanted her to know about it. In the VIP ward, the nurses were helping Bertha clean the room. One of them smiled when she saw them coming in. Mrs. Wilson is much better than before. She can even walk on her own now. Bertha's condition looked better than before, and her face was even glowing with a healthy complexion. Bessie held the table and walked around slowly. She approached Bertha, who was gazing out the window. Bertha looked fairly radiant, as if the light was returning to her. Bertha turned her head and smiled at them. You're here. She sat down on a chair and glanced at Pete. What about your mom? Is she working again? Yes. Pete's expression remained unchanged as he took two steps forward and passed an apple and a fruit knife to Bessie for her to prepare. Bessie sat at the table and cut the apple slowly. After a while, the door of the room opened. Bessie looked up and handed Pete the cut apple pieces. Come in. 
A thin and tall figure entered. He sat a medicine box on the table and removed his cap and a pair of dark sunglasses, revealing a slightly delicate face and a big smile. Grandma, I'm here to see you. Daniel had lived in Fairfield for some time and called Bertha Grandma as well. Bertha remembered him as a good-looking young man. Oh, Daniel, you're back? Bertha sat in the chair. It thrilled her to see him. Pete had never seen Daniel before, but judging from Bertha's reaction, he was probably Bessie's friend. He glanced at Daniel and lowered his head to continue cutting the apples. Bessie had already looked through Bertha's physical report. He had come this time to use his equipment to review Bertha again. Then he would do his research based on the results. After Pete cut the apple, he handed the pieces to Bertha and poured Daniel a cup of tea. Daniel took it and casually dragged a chair over to sit down. Thank you. Bertha looked good, both in spirits and in physical condition. The three of them stayed in the room the entire morning before Bertha urged them to hurry and have their lunch, saying it wasn't good to stay in the hospital. Okay, Grandma, then I'll come and see you another day. Daniel put on his sunglasses and peaked cap. He embraced Bertha gracefully before leaving. Bessie was anxious about the results of Daniel's examination, so she excused herself to follow him. Pete was the last to leave. Bertha waited for him to close the door and leave. Her eyes closed slightly and then slowly opened. She slipped on her slippers and walked out while using the wall for support. The VIP floor didn't have many people around. She watched the elevator floor lights descend, but Pete stopped at the sixth floor instead of the first floor. Bertha pursed her lips and returned to her room to get her robe before heading to the sixth floor. The sixth floor contained mostly single wards. Bertha looked in one room after another and finally saw Andrea in a room at the end of the corridor. She was lying on the bed, her left leg wrapped heavily in gauze, and several tubes were inserted into her. Bertha couldn't tell if she was unconscious or still asleep. Pete sat by the computer and occasionally glanced at Andrea. Bertha's eyes turned dark and she turned around quickly, staggering towards the elevator. Before she could go far, she leaned on the wall, covered her chest with one hand and slid down along the wall. A passerby lifted her. Old lady, are you okay? I'm fine. Thank you, young man. After a long while, Bertha eased her breathing and returned to her room with the help of a nurse. Three o'clock. Grace returned from Evanston but didn't go to the Smith family's house. She couldn't get through to Andrea and she was afraid that something had happened to Bertha. So she went to the hospital. When she arrived, Bertha was in bed but no one else was there. Mom, where's everyone else? Where's Andrea, Pete, Bessie? I only went to Evanston for a few days. How could they all be so full of trouble? She picked up her phone and looked down to call Bessie. She was angry and wanted to ask her how she was taking care of Bertha. Don't call Bessie. She's busy, Bertha said after opening her eyes. I knew you were biased towards her. She refused to come to do an apprenticeship with me in Evanston, but went there with a scum. Grace couldn't help herself. Forget it. I can't control her. I don't care what happens to her after high school. She also said this to show Bertha that her focus would be on Anne from now on. Bertha didn't speak. She looked out the window for a long time before saying, Do you remember me telling you last time that Bessie had been practicing the violin? Yes. What's wrong? Grace poured a glass of water for Bertha. Although Bertha had said that, she didn't mention Bessie's level. Grace had asked but assumed Bessie didn't take a graded test, so she didn't pay attention to it afterward. She thought to herself, could it be that Mom also wants Bessie to do an apprenticeship now that Anne was successfully accepted? Besides practicing the violin, Bessie liked to write her music compositions. Bertha said, She threw it away after writing it, but I kept it. When I was in the hospital, I asked you to take my luggage from the Smith family's house. Those music compositions were inside. Grace paused. The shock in her eyes was obvious. Bessie? She knows how to write music, too? 
Bertha coughed a few times, her muddy eyes bare, her voice soft and slow. I watched the video you sent me and the song that Anne played during the apprenticeship competition is the one Bessie played three years ago on her birthday. Say, isn't that strange? Episode 130 Grace Fulfills Her Duty In Grace's eyes, Bertha had always been an ordinary old woman. This was the first time she saw herself exuding such an attitude and aura. Grace froze for a moment before reacting to what she had just said. She almost lost her composure and stared at Bertha. How could it be? Mom, are you crazy? Don't make such a joke about me. How could Bessie possibly write that? She didn't pass a single exam. Bertha glanced at Grace and sat up, sighing softly. Aren't you aware of what level Anne is at? Would she be able to compose such a song? She spoke lightly, and there was no emotion in her expression. From the beginning, when Anne asked her questions about Bessie's music scores when Mr. Grint called her, Bertha had expected this in her heart. Thus, she had asked Grace for Anne's performance video. Like Mr. Grint, Bessie's other tracks didn't particularly impress her, but the track she played at her birthday party was extremely memorable. Although Anne had changed it a little, it wasn't as good as Bessie's original song, but it still left a deep impression. It was obvious how good the original track was. Mr. Anderson couldn't ignore Anne's skills and made an exception to choose her as an apprentice. Grace stood up, clenched her fists, and pursed her lips. Mom, I know you don't like Anne, but you can't be so biased. How do you know Anne can't write it? The information Bertha revealed vexed Grace. She felt confused because she clearly remembered what Mr. Grint had said about Anne. Mom, I didn't come back to quarrel with you. She didn't want to think more deeply about it. Instead of arguing further with Bertha, she went directly to the doctor to ask about Bertha's latest examination. After getting the results, she returned to Bertha's room to tell her she was going to the Smith family's house. She didn't see Bertha's disappointed expression as she turned around. With a click... The door closed. Bertha reached out and picked up her phone to call Mr. Grint. She looked at the call page with troubled eyes. When she first came to Chicago, she only wanted Bessie to stay at the Smith family's house. She didn't want Bessie to be alone after she died. But despite not seeing her for so long, Grace was still unreliable. Her call went through after two rings. Mr. Grint... Bertha stood up with her hand on the bed and walked to the window to look downstairs. Although it's a little presumptuous, I would still like for you to come to Chicago. Because of some issues, I can't travel to Evanston, so I want to see Bessie study under you. Bertha already knew Bessie's decision from the last time they spoke on this topic. She also knew that if it weren't for her, Bessie would already have gone to Evanston and she wouldn't be confined to a small town like Fairfield by herself. Three years ago, Mr. Grint had heard about the White family. He stayed for half a year in Fairfield because of Bessie. If it wasn't because he had matters to attend to in Evanston, he might have continued to stay there. After over ten years, Bertha had enough knowledge of Mr. Grint's character. Mr. Grint was unsettled by Bertha's call. Mr. Grint? Someone called from behind him. The sudden call brought him back to his senses. He rose from his chair, turned, and directly instructed the person. Go buy me an airline ticket to Chicago, the earliest one. He already knew Bertha was sick, but today, Bertha's words gave him an ominous hunch. He felt like she was entrusting her granddaughter to him. Mr. Grint squeezed the phone in his hand, began walking out of the room, and instructed as he went, Pack my luggage. I'll set off as soon as possible. The Smith family's house. When Grace came back, she realized many of the family members were there, including David, Daryl, and others. Everyone stood up warmly and welcomed her. Are you used to staying in Evanston? How is Anne getting along with Mr. Anderson? The Smith family's attitude towards Grace changed the moment Elise wanted to bring Anne to Evanston. Now that she was successfully accepted as a paying apprenticeship, 
by Mr. Anderson. Grace's status jumped. Everyone now considered her a member of the family. Before that, the Smith family looked down on her as a second wife with a rural background, and Grace had been a transparent person in their family. But now, even Daryl was smiling at her. After spending 12 years in the Smith family, Grace finally felt like she could hold her ground. Everything is fine, Grace replied with a smile. Daryl nodded, paused, and said, As for your eldest daughter, she might have animosity with our family because of Chloe. Daryl wasn't prepared to talk to Grace about this matter before, because he felt it wasn't necessary. But now, things were different. Grace nodded. She could tell ever since the recent attitude of the Smith family that they had chosen between Bessie and Anne. She only started studying under Mr. Anderson. It would have been nice to study under Mr. Grint, Grace suddenly said. Anne was right. Evanston was full of people who underestimated others. And the Perez family had only just touched one side of the Evanston circle. Even the Harper family, whom she had always been in awe of, were just nobodies in Evanston. But the Anderson family was unique. Mr. Anderson was a prestigious man, and his ancestor was also a famous musician. He was well known in the capital, and the Perez family told her about their status in Evanston. Everyone automatically placed the families of Evanston in one of three tiers. Ordinary people were on the bottom tier. Everyone considered the Perez and Harper families to be on the middle tier. The Anderson family was considered at the bottom rung of the top tier. However, the Grint family was more than midway up the highest tier, and Mr. Grint's connections could reach the top. Grandpa Perez hadn't mentioned who was above the Grint family, but Grace understood from Grandpa Perez's attitude that they were amongst the top of the tier in Evanston. Anne had become Mr. Anderson's apprentice and had already transformed things. Even Grace's position in the Smith family had changed. Grace didn't dare to imagine what would happen if Mr. Grint accepted Anne. In a hotel in Chicago, Bessie sat on the sofa, she didn't have class today, so she only brought her backpack and was writing musical scores while sitting by the window. Daniel fiddled with a computer and compared the test results from time to time. Daniel was sitting cross-legged on the floor and holding the newly printed data in his hand. It would be nice if we were in my laboratory. The small computer I brought is too slow. Bessie lowered her head and wrote her music composition calmly. She wrote two notes and then erased them again. She did this repeatedly before finally entering the right state. Her low-hanging eyebrows were furled and she suddenly turned around after remembering something. How much payment should I give Michael? She was talking about Michael's operation on Andrea. According to the rules, Daniel put his hand on the ground and glanced sideways at Bessie while touching his chin. Five hundred thousand dollars. Michael's hands of God weren't a joke. Okay, Bessie nodded and continued to write her musical notes. The phone Daniel put aside in the medicine box rang, and he picked it up. Matthew, hello. He was still looking at the results page on the computer. Matthew said a few words, and Daniel's eyebrows flicked as if he had heard something unbelievable. Is Robert crazy? He raised his hand and threw the phone to the side. Hearing Robert's name, Bessie looked up. What's wrong? That dog Robert forcibly blocked the major gates of Chicago and even found the Hacker Alliance to get hold of me. One hundred thousand dollars. Am I so valuable? Daniel cursed with a delicate face. Bessie thought something had happened and looked away after hearing this. She continued writing and said in a calm voice, Relax, even if there are five hundred Hacker Alliances, it's still useless. You say that as if you're Q. Daniel said, he sat back down on the floor. The computer finished printing a checklist. Daniel pulled it out. He glanced casually at the test results on the top and suddenly paused. Making sure he was discreet, he mixed this piece of paper in another pile. Bessie finally perfected the details of Noah Hyper's musical composition. She took another picture and sent it to him. It was already five o'clock. She put the pen and book in her backpack and reached out to throw the scrap papers into the trash. Then she walked over to Daniel, squatted down, and asked, No results yet? Ask this thing. 
Daniel leaned back on the table behind him and kicked the instrument with his leg before saying vaguely, I will have to change it eventually. Bessie flipped through the pile of papers. Most of the results were quite professional, so she didn't read all of them. Her interest was mainly in the hospital. It reminded her that Andrea and Bertha were both in the hospital, so she was worried that Pete was there by himself. Daniel accompanied Bessie to the elevator before returning to his room. He sat on the floor and pulled out the piece of paper he had tucked inside the pile. Then he laid down on his bed and muttered, What the hell? What caused such a big radiation spike? Was it an ore? A chemical element? A microorganism? Finally, Daniel covered his face with the piece of paper and released a long sigh. In the hospital, Bessie went to see Andrea first. She didn't enter and just watched through the window as Pete served her a meal. Andrea's mental state was okay, and because of Daniel's assurance, Bessie wasn't too worried about her. After a few minutes, Bessie left and went upstairs to see Bertha. Grace also came over after dinner. She saw Bessie and couldn't help but ask, Why are you here now? Don't you know the situation with your grandma? Grace served Bertha a spoonful of soup. Bessie dragged a chair over and sat down, then looked at Bertha with her arm resting on the armrest. She was irritable, but she still responded indifferently. Oh. This made Grace speechless. Bertha had always said that Bessie was sensible and wouldn't cause trouble for her. Grace simply wanted to laugh at this. Since she was young, how much trouble had Bessie caused? Not that she matured earlier than others. It was just that her personality was flawed. Bessie was indifferent, even though Bertha was in this state. Grace thought Bessie differed from Anne from a young age. Anne was very affectionate, but Bessie wasn't. When she divorced James, Anne cried terribly, but Bessie just stood coldly and silently to the side. Thus, James had competed with her over Anne's custody. And the most important point was that Bessie was too narrow-minded. She had failed to grasp so many presented opportunities in her life. In the beginning, Grace would still remind Bessie, nag her, and think about her. But since she didn't appreciate it, her passion disappeared completely, and she now focused on Anne. Bertha said she was biased, but why couldn't she see that this was all her fault? Grace pursed her lips and decided in her heart. Bertha fell asleep, and Bessie watched her with a pair of dark, clear, and shallow eyes. Grace picked up her purse and lowered her voice. Come out with me. Bessie felt like she and Grace had nothing to say to each other, but in order not to wake Bertha, she frowned and followed her. In the corridor at the elevator entrance. I'll be going back to Evanston two days from now to look after your sister. Grace looked at Bessie and took out a card. There's $100,000 on this. It's enough to last you from high school to university. If you lack money in the future, I will transfer it to this card. You can consider this the fulfilling of my duty. She did this to set aside her relationship, and also because Bertha had mentioned the music composition. Bessie looked down at the bank card and laughed loudly. What are you laughing at? Bessie refused the card, leaning back and said with cold eyes, No need, Miss Smith. I won't see you in the future. I hope you won't see me either. Goodbye. She nodded slightly at Grace. Her eyes were so calm and rid of any emotion. She turned and walked into Bertha's room. Bessie's unexpected reaction stunned Grace. Ding! The elevator door opened. An old and majestic face appeared. It was Mr. Grint standing before Grace. She couldn't help but feel like she was in a fantasy world. Mr. Grint was in Chicago? Mr. Grint? He stepped out of the elevator and ignored Grace. He walked past her, marched towards Bertha's room, and called out, Bessie, 